College senior Celia Huda had it all. She was a University of Florida competitive cheerleader, part of a successful dance team, and about to go to graduate school to become a nurse. She had everything to look forward to, but she crossed paths with a monster, forever shattering all of her dreams. This is her story. Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. If you've never been here before, my name is Kimberlea. Nice to finally meet you. And if you have been here before, you're probably wondering, Kimber, what is going on here? What is this? What is this orange couch doing here? My favorite color is orange and I've always wanted an orange couch. And no, this is not here to stay. I'm creating something new. It'll be happening soon. And this couch was part of it today. I was filming for something else and I needed a bigger space because there was someone else sitting here with me. I think I might bring it back around maybe at Halloween since, you know, it might go with the motif, but try not to be too distracted. Today's case combines a few topics that we've talked about before. One, it's a Florida case. So it's part of my Florida murder series and it involves a university student and she's a cheerleader. And it's sad that these characteristics seem to somehow be related in other cases like this. What drew me into this case was Florida, of course, because that's my home state, but also because as I was getting interested in it, I was shocked by the lack of coverage there was, especially because of how disturbing the series of circumstances really are. And I think you'll know exactly what I mean as we get into this. But before we do, please just give me a moment of your time. We have a new sponsor today that I haven't talked about yet. If you like doggies, you're going to want to listen to this next part because I have something very exciting to share. Today's sponsor is Sundays, and I couldn't be more excited. If you've been here for a while, you would know I have two dogs. One is Dexter, and yes, he's named after Dexter Morgan. He's 10, and his brother is this little guy. He's an old man named Kingston. We've had some scares with little Kingy. He's 13, and well, he does have a heart condition and lots of medications, and those medications make him unable to hold his pee, so don't make fun of his little cute little doggy diaper but I love them so much. They're part of my family, and that is why I try to do everything I can to give him and Dexter the best life possible. That includes the best foodie, as I like to call it, and that's where Sundays comes into their daily routine. Sundays is fresh, air-dried dog food made from a short list of human-grade ingredients. It's co-founded by Dr. Tori Waxman, a practicing veterinarian, and it contains 90% meat, 10% vegetables, and zero synthetic nutrients, and that's important. One of my favorite things is that I know Kingston loves Sundays so much because he hardly has any teeth left, and Sundays is soft. It's easy for him to chew. He used to swallow his food whole, and now I can see him chewing it, enjoying it, and it makes me so happy because I have tried so many foods, just attempting to get him excited about eating, and he finally is with Sundays. I can tell it's delicious because it smells like real food. And you can see how fast both of my dogs run to devour it. I'd say try the Sundays challenge against your current dog food and let your dogs decide for themselves. Also, because it's air dried for over 11 hours, these jerky style pieces, they maintain the maximum amount of nutrients from high quality ingredients. I also love it because it is so easy. I will not do things that are complicated. And unlike other fresh dog food that I have tried, Sundays does not require refrigeration or preparation because of their air drying process. You just pour it and serve it, that's it. So it's so easy to feed your fur baby top quality food even on the go. No fridge, no preparation, no cleanup, no mess, no hassle, just nothing special. And that's great because I do a lot of traveling and I have to leave my pets to be cared for by someone else. And I love that they can maintain their nutritious food routine because of how easy it is. There's another convenient part of this. Guess what? And I know this has happened to you. I used to forget to get food until it ran out, but not anymore with Sundays because every order ships right to your door. You'll never have to worry about running out of dog food again. And it's also very affordable. It costs 40% less than other healthy dog food brands because Sundays doesn't waste money shipping frozen packages. Instead, they spend on what matters, sourcing the best all natural ingredients for your doggy. And to make things even easier, Sunday has an auto delivery program with 20% off repeat orders. Plus right now, Sundays was nice enough to extend a special discount to you. Get 35% off your first order by clicking my link below. And thank you so much to Sundays for sponsoring today's video. 
Now I'd like to introduce you to Salia Huda. She was actually born in Ghana, which is a country in West Africa. She's the youngest child of her parents, husband and wife, Ali and Hawua Huda. They already had two children by the time Salia came around, and Salia's older brother, Abdul, was seven years old, and she also had a sister, Sean, that was about five. Salia Huda was born in Ghana on May 27th, 1989. But eventually, when Salia was about five, Sean was about 10, and Abdul was about 12 years old, their parents decided to immigrate to the United States. They moved to Gainesville, Florida. They wanted to move to America for many of the same reasons that other people do, because they wanted a better life for themselves and their children. They wanted their children to have a better chance in life than they felt that they had growing up in West Africa. It was quite a culture shock for them as a family, but the children were still young enough to assimilate easily. The children attended P.K. Young Developmental Research School in Gainesville. It's a K-12 public developmental school that's connected to the University of Florida. And students stay here from kindergarten through the time they graduate high school. And of course, then they hopefully go to college, which is what it prepares them for, specifically to go to the University of Florida, which is, like I said, connected to this school. The students are actually selected by a lottery to reflect the demographic of the school age population of the state. My daughter went to a similar school. We had to wait a long time to get accepted and get a spot. We had to win a spot. And these schools are usually very highly sought out. They provide a superior education compared to other public schools, especially with this one being associated with one of Florida's biggest and highly regarded universities. P.K. Young has won awards for being in the top of the best schools in the nation. Celia's parents valued education above everything else. It was the highest objective to give their children the opportunity to get a quality education. It was all about family and academics. And I know admission to these schools are very selective, but if you are enrolled and you have siblings, those siblings usually get priority. So it must have been a big deal for Celia's parents to have their children attending this school. They took education, like I said, very seriously, which meant their kids were expected to make it their main focus. And sometimes that made it hard for them to connect with American children, especially when the girls are getting older, they're becoming teenagers. And Sean and Celia weren't allowed the same freedom their friends had. They weren't allowed to date. They had very strict rules. And it was hard when their parents had beliefs and traditions from a different country that they wanted to honor, as well as honoring being an American and growing up differently. The older two children of the three seemed to have an easier time with the rules but Celia was a rebel from a young age. Everyone could tell that she was all about doing things her own way. She was very curious, adventurous, outgoing, and athletic. She was involved in sports and she loved dancing. And this meant she was drawn to more social environments than her siblings. She was a natural born performer. As soon as music would come on, she would start moving to the beat. It was like it was a part of her, something she couldn't help. She just had to get up and she had to move. She ran track. She was part of dance schools that focused on hip-hop dancing, and she also did gymnastics. Eventually, this led her down the path of wanting to become a cheerleader. So that is what Celia did. It started actually back in middle school and high school. But then afterward, she enrolled at Santa Fe College, which is just 13 minutes away from her family's home. This is a junior college. Some of you might call it a community college, and most students start here two years before transferring into a state university. They have programs that are specifically designed to guarantee admission to the University of Florida, which was the school Celia wanted to attend. She tried out and got on the Santa Fe College Saints cheerleading squad. And this was her first taste of what it was like cheering for a college sports team. And the Saints were basketball players. But her big dream was to cheer for the University of Florida. In 2008, that dream was closer to coming true when she got accepted into UF as a junior in the fall, majoring in family, youth, and community sciences. Then she tried out for a coveted spot on the university's cheerleading squad. And if you don't know how competitive this is, one simple Google search is all it takes. College cheerleading is huge. It takes a lot of talent and athleticism, which were both things that Celia had. But she didn't just want to be a UF cheerleader. She didn't want to just be rallying around football players. She wanted to be a competitive cheerleader. If you don't know the difference, think of the show Cheer. I think it was on Netflix. These teams compete against other top Division I cheerleading programs across the nation at the NCAA Nationals in Daytona Beach, Florida. It's it's a pretty big deal. And these cheerleading teams are comprised 
of co-eds with elite stunting and tumbling abilities. There's a number of skills that someone should have when they're even considering trying out for something like the University of Florida Gators competitive cheer team. I'm not gonna name them all, but you have to know what these moves are to begin with and then how to do them successfully. That's a lot. And you have to know how talented Celia was to land a spot on this team as a cheerleader. It was her smile that immediately made an impression on the coaches and the judges, in addition to her skills. She was a great flyer, and she ended up as one of the squad's limited number of flyers. This is the one that gets thrown up in the air doing all the tricks and who has to be caught by her fellow teammates. Her teammates would actually fight over who would be the one to catch her as she fell from the air. She loved cheerleading and she loved being a part of a team. And when I was looking at pictures, I couldn't help but notice how toned and athletic she was. She was dedicated and it showed it's a tough sport. There are whole YouTube channels and YouTube videos with tips and tricks and the entire experience of becoming a competitive cheerleader, everything from looking the part and being cheer ready to how hard it is juggling competitive cheer and college, not to mention having a social life at the same time. They have practices three or four times a week and they have around four performances every year. And when they're practicing, they're doing conditioning, they're doing tumbling, as well as preparing for all kinds of events and appearances. So it takes a lot of time and effort. Celia's weeks were very busy with practices and working out. It's a lot, especially with an already full schedule of classes and wanting to hang out with friends. Not only that, dance, as I mentioned, was a huge part of Celia's life. So on top of school and cheerleading, She's also in a competitive dance team called Urban Essence Dance Team. They've appeared on BET and MTV, and she became the secretary of the group. It's where she met girls who would ultimately become some of her closest friends. For example, the president of the group, Tarnisha Gaines, loved Celia's feisty nature and her leadership ability. Something people noticed first about Celia was how tiny she was. She was barely five feet tall, but she had a very big personality. She joined the dance group with her longtime friend, Takaya Natil, who everyone called Kaya. She knew Celia really well, and she appreciated how bold she was. She said she was the type of person who would honestly and humbly tell you when she was upset with you. She wore her heart on her sleeve. It's a good quality to have in a friend. She wouldn't let anyone walk all over her despite her size. Celia loved dancing so much. She would dance even when there wasn't music playing because she could probably hear it in her head. She moved to her own beat, and that went for how she lived her life as well. There was one time when her and her friends, they took a trip to Panama City Beach for spring break, and when they got to the sand, there she was, without any music on, just dancing away. Friends who were on this trip, like Karen Richards, who was also on her cheerleading squad, and some of her teammates that were responsible for catching Celia during her flying stunt said, that they always knew Celia to be the type of person who lived in the moment. But as much as Celia had a fun side, she was equally as serious, which made her a great athlete. She performed even when she was injured. Despite her teammates telling her, you know what, you should take it easy, Celia would push herself and she would continue to work through it. Karen appreciated her willingness to work hard for their team. And it was great to know that you had someone who was willing to do their best and work their hardest for a shared goal. The Gainesville community itself is very tight, especially if you are a local. When college students go out, they all hang out at popular spots and everyone gets to know each other. Celia and many of the girls she danced with and cheered with, they were well known. They were kind of like local celebrities. And that was part of the culture, going out, clubbing, partying. We know the drill when we're in college. But having protective immigrant parents that made it hard for Celia to be as independent as many of her friends, especially since she was still living at home when she started school at UF. However, she was an adult, and finally she made the decision to move out on her own into her own apartment. Despite her parents not liking this idea, she explained that it had to do with all the activities she was doing. It was too much. She wanted to live closer to campus. But UF was only a 10 minute drive away from her parents' house. The truth was, Celia wanted to get out from underneath her parents' watchful eye. Her sister, Sean, felt the same way when she moved out on her own. Of course they loved their parents, but they didn't like the philosophy they had about boys. Their parents said, boys can wait. Relationships can come later in life and education came first. Well, Celia, like many girls her age, wanted to have freedom and have fun wanted to have her own life aside from her parents to grow into her own person. 
So she moved out into an off-campus apartment called the District Apartment Complex. It was only a six-minute drive to campus. It's now called Pavilion on 62, but it still looks exactly the same. Very student-focused, with things like a big, real sand volleyball court outside, hammocks to lay on. They have a gym, basketball court that was decorated with gators colors, really nice pool area. There was also a really great common area with a pool table, and they also had a dog park. And so Leah wanted an apartment that accepted dogs because she got her own dog. She named him Vegas, and she absolutely adored him. She treated him like he was her child. So Leah was thriving. She had a group of close friends. She was doing well in school. She had a new place to live, a fur baby to keep her company, and a loving family. She spent a lot of time with her cousins as well. She comes from a large West African family, and she had many ties with other cousins of hers who also lived in Gainesville and were close to her age. She and her cousin Danielle Agumon were very close. They bonded over their love for dance, and they both participated in the University of Florida's African Student Union's dance squad. This was on top of all of her other responsibilities. Her dance team, her cheerleading responsibilities, but it was very important to her. Yuchana Akiju was the choreographer of the squad and would organize their practices at the Rights Union Amphitheater. Celia was just as dedicated to dancing for the African Student Union as she was about her other group activities. And since Celia was so tiny, she was used to be the one that they would throw into the air anytime they needed someone to do a more complicated move. The African Student Union was founded to support and unite African students and to promote awareness of African issues and culture to all students and the Gainesville community. This organization was formed to represent the diverse African continent at the University of Florida. Whether you were from North, South, East, or West Africa, you were welcome to be a part of the African Student Union. The dance troupe put on performances and they would showcase traditional African dances complete with all the native costumes. It was a great way to bond with other African students and also her cousin, Danielle. They had so many fond memories of dancing together. And you can imagine how much time Celia put into all of this. When she wasn't dancing and cheering or in class, Celia loved to spend time with her childhood friend, Indy Horn. She had known Celia since they were 12 years old. And now that Celia had her own apartment, Indy would bring her dog, Bubby, over to play with Vegas and the girls would stay up watching movies that they would rent from Redbox. You guys remember Redbox? I don't even know if that's still a thing, but you could go to these little kiosks and you could get DVDs and they would rent a bunch of them. But as busy as Celia was, she wouldn't have time to take these DVDs back. So they would be lying all over her apartment and constantly racking up large late fees, but it was worth every moment. Indy loved spending time over at Celia's. She had a number of animals, not just her dog Vegas, but a fish, mice, and a snake. And Indy referred to it as Celia's own mini zoo. They were best friends. They would confide in one another and Indy loved how welcoming Celia was. She thought that she was a joy to be around and she made others feel comfortable in her presence. They had been through a lot together. And even as busy as Celia was, she still found time to spend with friends. Her apartment was only about a 20 minute drive from her parents, so she visited on a regular basis, especially in a time she needed something, like many college students do, or to celebrate holidays or other important events with her family. But it wasn't just her family and friends she devoted her time to. Her apartment was also close to The Village, which is a local assisted senior living residence where Celia actually volunteered on the weekends and any time she had free time. She was practicing her bedside manner for the future because by 2010, Celia was in her senior year of UF. She was planning to go into graduate school for nursing, and she and her other close cousin, Elam, were so excited. They were planning to go to graduate school together, so they would spend so many hours talking about nursing. Once out on her own around 2008, Celia was able to go out more. She didn't have to worry about going home at a certain time, and the Gainesville, North Florida club scene, it was huge for young adults. Like many other big cities, especially ones that revolve around universities, there's a lot going on. Going out and enjoying the nightlife with friends was a part of Celia's normal routine. And of course, she would meet a lot of people, including guys, and it wasn't long before she had a boyfriend. You know what I'm going to say next. Her parents were not thrilled. This wasn't the only guy Celia had hung out with and gone close to, but this one became an official boyfriend, exclusively for Celia. His name was Antonio Drayton. And in Celia's mind, he was a catch. 
The first thing that attracted her was, of course, his looks and his charisma. They met at a club and they hung out and talked. And eventually, Celia found Antonio, or Tony, as most people called him that were close to him, on MySpace. And they began messaging until finally they met up in person and just hit it off. It made sense. Tony was the life of the party. His energy matched Celia's. He was popular. He was definitely a ladies' man. Ladies loved him. And the thing about Tony was that he had a steady job. He went to church. He had his own apartment, his own car. He dressed well. But he had a bad boy side. And I hate to put it this way, but the first thing that came to mind is when guys say, she's a woman in the streets, but a freak in the sheets. It's not exactly a great analogy here, but I think you understand. He knows how to be serious when he needs to, but he had a really funny, sexy, fun side to him, and many girls like that. And he stood out with his long hair and his tattoos and his jewelry, a big, bright smile, great sense of humor. And when you're in your 20s, those things are important. I mean, I'm, I'm just basically describing my own boyfriend, and I'm way past 20, so those things are still important. There's still some of the qualities that we see in others because it's their style. It's what makes us who we are. And this was one of Celia's first more serious relationships. But everything she liked about Tony were all the things her parents were not impressed with. He was also older than her, even though it wasn't much. I think she was about 19, he was 22, but it might have been the neck tattoos or the bad boy look. Parents are usually not fans of that, and you already know how protective Celia's parents were. It wasn't just Tony. It could have been any guy. They just had a strong opinion about relationships while their daughter was paying for a quality education. She already had to split her time between all of her extracurricular activities. They just didn't think he should be another one of them. So they let it be known that they were not fond of her new beau. Some of Celia's good friends also had their opinions. Don't we all care about our friends and who they're dating? They didn't know what she saw in Tony, mostly because they would hear or maybe even see him doing things that didn't seem faithful. Celia considered the relationship committed, exclusive, like it was only the two of them, and she held to her promise that Tony was her boyfriend. There was no one else for Celia. That was it. But that's not what friends saw when they went out to clubs and witnessed Tony talking to other women and rumors that he was doing even more than that. Everyone that knew Celia knew that she was worth the type of love that she gave to others. She was giving Tony her all, and yet it was like trying to tame a wild horse. I grew up hearing this theme play out in songs all the time, where there's a guy that you want, but you know he's probably not good for you. But then that just makes you want him even more. Does anyone remember No Doubt, the song Bathwater, where Gwen Stefani sang about a man that all the ladies wanted, and he could choose any of them? And she knew that she was probably setting herself up for a heartbreak. And in the song, she asks why we choose the boys that are naughty. Plus, she knows she can't tame him, but she just keeps trying and hopes that she'll be his only girl. But she knows that she's just another one on his list. Yet she says... She just can't help it. He's her kind of man. And I think many of us can relate to that. It's a great song, but it's also good because it begs the age-old question, why do all the good girls always want the bad boys? Gwen actually asked that in the song. I promise this is not a tangent. It's very relevant to this aspect of who Celia was. She was the quintessential good girl. She came from a large, loving family. She had parents that cared about her, that put strict rules in place to hopefully set her on the right path or the best path in their eyes. She was a good student, a good athlete. She had many opportunities at her fingertips. You would think her perfect match would be someone just like her. But instead, it seems like she was attracted to her opposite. Why? Parents wonder, friends wonder, sometimes we even ask ourselves, so I Googled it, because I wanted a psychological reason why women find the bad boys so attractive, even though we know they're trouble. One article I found about how women will get involved with a guy that all their friends and family will warn them about, show them all the red flags, and they still find him appealing. Well, the bad boy is defined by not only evolutionary biologists, I'm not kidding, and psychologists, as men who are masculine, rebellious, bold, and tend to exude exaggerated sexuality. And they're usually emotionally unavailable. It goes on to explain that if a girl's inner life is unexpressed, meaning she has to keep a lot in, she's closeted, not being herself, she may be drawn to a more rebellious man because through him, she's vicariously expressing her inner rebel, the things that she wishes she could possess. 
she can when she has him because the bad boy is now an extension of her. So now she gets to have that as part of her identity. A lot of times good girls will admire the freedom that a bad boy seems to have. He can do as he pleases. He answers to no one. And data shows that women who are sheltered are more drawn to men who are adventurous. And it makes sense. I think about pop culture and I think about Stranger Things. When the good girl like Nancy falls for the Steve Harrington. Or going back even further, Sidney Prescott and Scream falling for bad boy Billy Loomis, who was clearly trying to take her virginity, but acting like he was in love with her. I'm sure almost all of you have seen that movie and know that relationship did not end well. But bad boys, they're mysterious. They may be different and it makes them kind of forbidden, especially if your parents don't approve. We want what we can't have, right? But as exciting as this relationship initially was for Celia, over time, she started to realize she also felt hurt. She and Antonio would not see eye to eye on certain things and she couldn't trust him. So eventually, after about a year and a half of dating, Celia decided to break it off. By June 2010, she told her friend Kaya that she felt like she wasn't acting like herself anymore, that she was surprised at the things she was doing, saying, and thinking. She wanted to remain friends with Antonio, and she did, but they weren't just friends because they would hook up here and there. That's just how these relationships go sometimes. But for the most part, Celia had finally realized it wasn't going to work out. It's tough because had Antonio been all the things that she wished for, plus the parts of him that she actually did like and that did exist, she would have loved to make it work. But they were arguing more and more, mostly over loyalty and trust. Antonio still had a lot more freedom than Celia since she was studying, cheering, and in college. So keeping tabs on him was probably exhausting. He was a 22-year-old guy who just wasn't ready to settle down. Her parents were happy. Her friends thought this was the best for them as well. And eventually that same year, Celia met another guy, 21-year-old Mike Carter. They were the same age and they had a lot in common. And Mike just made a better match. They end up clicking really well and they started dating. Celia's friends were happy for her. It's not easy to move on, but Celia was determined to finish her senior year at UF and start to focus on her career. It's December of that year, 2010. Summer came and went, so did fall, and now winter break is next. The holidays are right around the corner. Celia and her family are preparing for their next celebration. And after Christmas, Celia still had a couple weeks before classes began. It's December 29th. She reaches out to her friend Indy, a good friend from back home that she's always hanging out with during the holidays, and asks her if she wanted to go out later that night, maybe for some drinks and dancing. And Indy was like, yeah, just come through whenever. So Celia says, okay, I'll come by later. Celia and Mike had been hanging out at her apartment that day and he spent the night the night before and now Celia had to run some errands. So they parted ways for the time being. She needed to stop by her parents' house that evening and then she planned to go out with Indy. Then she was gonna go back home and hang out with her boyfriend Mike at her place. However, Celia never showed up at Indy's. And you know what happens, right? It's the holidays, everybody's busy. So at first, Indy didn't think that much of it. Was it a little odd that Celia didn't let her know she wasn't gonna hang out? Yes but they had known each other since they were little, so she knew that by the next day, she would just say what happened and Celia would explain. But when she texted her the next day, like, what happened to you last night? Indy never got a response. She did think that was a little odd. It just wasn't really like Celia to ignore a good friend, but still she was gonna let it slide. Two days later, on New Year's Eve, Indy gets a call from Celia's mom. Now that was out of the ordinary. Celia's mom asked Indy if she'd heard or seen from Celia, and she tells her no. She explains they had plans. Celia never came on Wednesday, December 29th. She never showed up. Well, Celia's mom tells Indy that they haven't heard from her either. The last time they saw her was that same evening. It was Wednesday around 4 p.m. She dropped by. She hung out. She grabbed an insurance card she was looking for, and she left around 6. Indy wasn't worried. She said that sometimes Celia did this. She was so busy with classes and her boyfriend or whatever she had going on, she just didn't call back. But she will eventually. As close as Indy and Celia were, Indy knew that sometimes Celia needed time alone. And she would respond when she was ready. They also have this kind of, I'd call it a philosophy on keeping in touch with each other, basically. They always let each other know if they're going anywhere like different, like if there's any special event, life events, personal things, that maybe Celia wouldn't normally share she would share with Indy. That was their special bond. 
you know, you may not want your business out there, but it's important to at least let one person know. And that person for Celia was Indy. And since Celia had not mentioned anything, Indy just thought she was probably busy and would get back in touch with everyone soon. After all, it's New Year's Eve. Celia probably had plans. Well, Celia's family felt differently. They kept in touch on a regular basis, even just to check in. And Celia had never been this silent this long, especially for no reason. They had just seen her. So Sean, her sister, kept calling and texting, but she wasn't getting an answer. So she went to Celia's Facebook. When she realized that there wasn't any activity for nearly three days, that was it. It was the night of the 31st, New Year's Eve, and Sean just had this terrible feeling inside. As sisters, she and Celia were very close. They could feel if the other wasn't happy or something had happened. And Sean had this gut feeling like something horrible was going on. Whenever something wasn't right, Celia and Sean knew. They just did. And Sean's feeling was stronger than it had ever been before. The next day, Celia's family contacted the Gainesville Police Department. Lieutenant Jarrett Wineland helped them file a missing persons report. He asked them when was the last time they saw or spoke to Celia, and they relayed to him it was the evening of December 29th. Celia came by around 4, she was picking something up, and then she left around 6 p.m. and she was wearing black University of Florida sweatpants. Her dad was the last one to see her, and she always kept in touch and would let her family know what was going on. She said she was going to be going back to her apartment. So the lieutenant is given the address to Celia's residence over at the district complex to take a look and see if she did go back there. It's 1 p.m. that afternoon, and police make it over to Celia's apartment where she lives by herself to do a welfare check. The first thing that they were checking for was her silver Nissan Sentra. And they realize it's not in the usual spot, and they don't see it in the vicinity near her building. So they add that to the missing persons report, and then they get a key from the landlord. They didn't need a search warrant or anything at this point because she had been missing for three days. So they were conducting a welfare check. They go inside, and they notice her apartment is very organized, it's clean, it's well kept, and they're searching room by room looking for Celia or anything out of the ordinary, and nothing looks amiss. Everything looked normal. For example, her closet. Nothing seemed to be taken out. It wasn't like things were ripped off the shelves or ripped off hangers like she was leaving really suddenly. To the contrary, she even had a cheerleading uniform that was set out on a hanger, the top and bottom, just neatly set there ready to go to be put on. These pictures always get to me. It makes me realize how similar we all are. On her shelves, you can see her perfume bottles, Johnson's lotion, even eardrops for her dog's ears, as well as books, actual light bulbs, I mean, just miscellaneous items that we all have, and nothing was disturbed. Here's her desk and her workspace with her computer. She had even painted her walls a bright green and a bright blue, which was definitely her personality. Her laptop case is there. She's got pictures of friends and family, a printer, things that a college student would have in their room. There was also a collage on a cork board hanging on her bedroom wall with lots of pictures of her, her friends, her dog Vegas, but no Celia in her apartment. No signs that anything was wrong until they got to her bathroom. Upon opening the door, they get their first clue that something isn't right. Inside, they found little Vegas. He was shaking, he was scared. He was crawled in a little ball, and from the looks of it, it looked like he'd been in there for days. Now, when Indy heard that Vegas was locked up in a bathroom like this, this is when she knew this was more serious. Indy knew how much Celia loved her dog. There was no way she was gonna leave him like that, ever, never. Something was wrong. Police have enough information to double down on their efforts to locate Celia. They put out an ABB for her car and the missing persons report is now in effect. All they can do is wait until another lead comes in and it wasn't long before a potential one does. Police are always trying to connect the dots. When a new case comes in and there are open cases in the area, they try to see if any of those open cases can be closed by comparing their facts. They either have to make the connection or rule them out. And many times it comes down to the description of the missing person and matching it to any known victims who have been found dead or alive. And as they're going through these cases one by one, matching details that could have similarities, one stands out. Back on December 30th, two days earlier in the early morning hours around three o'clock in the morning, the Alachua County Sheriff's Office gets a 911 call. A mother and daughter 
are driving on County Road 225 in Gainesville, about a half a mile north of the Gainesville Raceway. It's a dark, isolated stretch of road. There's nothing but trees on both sides. So it's easy to see something big and bright in the distance. And as they get closer, it looked like a burning car on the side of the road. So they call police. I did my best to measure on Google Maps, and this is my approximate location that I made where the 911 call was coming in. You can see there's just road and trees forever. The 911 caller said that they were coming around a bend and they saw flames on the side of the road. And the only place I saw a bend or a turn off in the distance is right here. This matches up to how far away they were from the raceway. So I assume they turned left and they saw a fire on the west side of the road to the left of them. I can never be sure, but this is my best educated approximation of where the cops went. When they get there, the fire is still burning, but at this point it looks less like a car is on fire and more like a brush fire, which is very common out here. So they're starting to do the routine extinguishing. It's still dark, there's a lot of smoke, the fire department is on site, they're putting out this fire. There are no street lights in this area, it's not residential nature, so there's no houses nearby or anything. The closest business is that racetrack. It's very desolate. It's obvious once the fire is out that there was a body lying there. It was about 20 feet away from the roadway. The fire appeared to be an attempt to destroy the body or conceal evidence. And now we've had two previous cases that have done back-to-back -back that were not planned. I had no idea they were all going to include this aspect. A fire to conceal a crime. However, this is apparently a very common way that criminals try to get rid of everything. As we have seen in my last video concerning Andrea Del Vesco, the room, I'll show you it here if you haven't seen that video, I won't spoil it, but we know by looking at scenes like this, the fires destroy everything in their paths. And it's true. They can and usually do make identification of bodies very difficult, if not impossible. In this case, the crime scene technician's main job that night was to identify who this person was. They could not tell if it was a male or female. The fire seemed to accomplish the goal of hiding this person's identity. So they do the next best thing. They begin to look around the scene for any identifying evidence that may have been left behind. Anything could be important. So they begin collecting every single piece of debris, big, small, in between anything and everything, trash, items along the roadway, the vicinity of the body. They look and they found this which looked like maybe a stack of business cards or a portion of a wallet. I couldn't really make it out, and I can't see what this top card says, but it does look like a card. And this right here in the next picture appears to be that same item or items, and the CSI team is flipping through. This is definitely a business card. So that's important, because maybe a family member would recognize this, or maybe they'll call the business and connect this person to places that they normally purchase things from. This one right here was for handcrafted furniture and cabinetry. As the sun starts to come up, it was easier for them to find items in the brush and on the side of the road. They began marking them with yellow numbered placards like this one. Everything was important no matter how small and seemingly insignificant. They know that someone had to have driven here and taken this person out of their vehicle so things could have fallen from the perpetrator's vehicle or from the perpetrator themselves. They collect this material which looked like it could be clothing or a blanket of some kind that was actually melted onto the body. They also collected this melted cell phone case. That's pretty significant. Even something like this, a napkin was collected. They also found a plastic bag along with an empty pack of cigarettes and a lot of little small items were all sent back to the lab for DNA testing. Another telltale sign that this fire was set intentionally was this distinct smell of gasoline that was coming from this scene. Dealing with victims involved in arsons adds an even bigger challenge because the DNA that could have been on their clothing, on or even in their bodies can be burned away. 90% of this poor victim's body had been burned. However, when CSI Tina Tuck was doing an examination at the scene, she noticed that there was one portion of the victim's face that was still intact. It was a small portion across the bridge of their nose. And when the sun came up, she could tell that the skin had a dark tone to it, most likely African-American. Then she took into account the size of the victim. And because of how small their stature was, it was believed that they were looking at a small black female. They did attempt to take fingerprints, but the fingers were so badly burned 
that they just were not able to do it at the scene. So eventually the victim was transported to the medical examiner's office for a full exam and autopsy. This was all going on from the early morning hours of Thursday, December 30th into the 31st. And Celia was reported missing on the 1st of January, just a couple days later. So because there was a link between Celia's ethnicity and the unidentified victim in that other case, and they happened close in time, investigators were starting to put them together. Unbelievably, even though the fingers were so badly charred, this medical examiner was able to pull one fingerprint and they immediately ran it through the database. Detective Duff and Meyer gets a call and he's informed that they found a match in the system. The victim found in the brush fire was identified as Celia Huda. Wow. However, they still want to go one step further. They end up matching two of her tattoos that could still be visible on her body with what her parents provided them in their description on the missing persons report. Now, one thing that was acknowledged right away was that this ID was made from an arrest record, one where Celia was actually arrested. Here's her mugshot. At the time of her arrest, fingerprints were taken, and this arrest was only about a month or so earlier in November. This would be very surprising news to her family. But first, the most devastating news would have to be delivered to her mom and dad. Celia's sister will never forget how she found out that Celia was no longer alive. Their brother called and said, come home now. And in the background, she could hear her mother screaming. And she said, if you've never heard someone who's lost a child scream, it's a sound you'll never forget. I've heard it's animalistic. It's something that comes out of a deep part of a person's body, like from their soul. It's extreme devastation and helplessness. It's knowing that it's too late to change anything. And all those dreams for their child is shattered into a million pieces. Once Sean got to her parents' house, she saw all the cop cars and she knew it wasn't good. It was unspeakable. She couldn't believe it. When they told her how they found her little sister was too much for her to even react to, it's still hard for her to talk about years later. Instantly bringing her to tears. I can only imagine and I don't like to. It's heartbreaking. But at this point, they have not completed the autopsy, so they have not concluded Celia's manner of death. It was expected to be ruled a homicide since it was clear that this fire did not start by itself, but that was yet to officially be determined. Of course, once her identity is confirmed, the media got a hold of this case. And at first, they did run a lot of stories with headlines about a cheerleader being found burned on the side of the road. But I was shocked at how little attention this case got. When I went back to known links talking about this case, they were all taken down. Luckily, there were some awesome people who preserved what some of those in news articles said at the time by copying and pasting them verbatim to forums like cncpunishment.com, its crime and capital punishment site, where I was able to dig up more information about what was being reported. I wanted to know what was unfolding at the time. I know this case is from 2010. Well, I'm going to tell you, that shouldn't matter. I researched cases dating back way before that like the Coleman family in 2008 or Tara Lynn Grant that was in 2007. And there are links to those old articles and segments that are still online, but not in this case. You can clearly see as I click each link, there's nothing there. And that is so disheartening. I had to really dig to find every detail of this timeline. And that's exactly what investigators were doing. They were piecing together what was known about Celia's whereabouts and actions before she went missing. A man named Art Forgey was a public information officer at the time for the sheriff's office, and he did speak to media and said in early January 2010 that they were definitely viewing this as a suspicious death, and he anticipated that the medical examiner would make the determination that it was a homicide, but that there was no definite time frame for when the medical examiner would be finished with that analysis. However, he said that the cause of death would, quote, probably be ruled a murder, end quote. One media outlet that still has information about this was alligator.org, and this was actually a publication called The Independent Florida Alligator. And according to their website, it was founded in 1906 as the University News, which was an independent, student-owned newspaper. It was created to serve University of Florida. And in 1912, that newspaper became part of University of Florida's administration, and it was renamed the Florida Alligator. So student journalists at UF were responsible for keeping the story alive. So thank you, because that is where I got a lot of this information and it is still up there. At this point, 
there was not an official homicide investigation being conducted because they were waiting on the word from the medical examiner. But an investigation into a suspicious death was happening, and that is where we got all the photos of Celia's apartment. It was actually stated by that same police representative that the question was whether Celia started the fire by herself or if the fire was started with different intent, like trying to cover up a crime. And I'm sitting here thinking, did they really think she started the fire herself? Like this was self-inflicted? Because that's a new way for me. I mean, I have not heard of that, that being common at all. But I guess they were just putting all the theories out there. By January, the police announced a $1,000 reward for any information relating to leads that would get them to an arrest. And they provide a Crime Stoppers number saying that callers can remain anonymous. And they're still trying to locate Celia's car. That was actually the very next lead in this case. Police put a picture out there in a description of Celia's car. It was recently painted a titanium silver color. It had aftermarket headlights, aluminum rims, as well as a University of Florida cheerleading sticker in the rear window. And the license plate number was Florida plate 778HRB. After this was put out to the public, a witness did come forward. They said around 2.15 in the morning on December 30th, they were traveling to work and they saw a four-door Nissan parked in a ditch on the side of the road of County Road 225. And that is where Celia's body was discovered. But they finally get another hit that's even better about her car. Someone called in on the afternoon of Monday, January 3rd, and said a car matching that exact description was parked outside their apartment for the last few days. A silver Nissan Sentra. The apartment complex was called Turtle Oaks, and it was located right here at 1505 Southwest 42nd Street. This complex is about a 30 minute drive from where Celia's body was located about 14 miles away. The caller had told police that the car had been sitting in their apartment complex for a few days and they thought it was suspicious because there was a purse that could be seen on the back seat and I believe a wallet on one of the front seats. So police go out to investigate and sure enough, they run the tags and the car is a 2001 silver Nissan Sentra and it belongs to Celia Huda. Here it is, this is how they found it. Upon opening the back door, they see the purse on the back seat, as the caller explained, and to the naked eye, the interior doesn't appear to have any prominent blood drops, no smears. But one thing crime scene technician Tina Tuck noticed was the overwhelming smell of gasoline. They knew they were gonna have to tow it to the Florida Fire Lab for full analysis, but right away, when Tina removed one of the floor mats from the back seat, it was completely saturated with gasoline, or what seemed to be gasoline. The entire floorboard was covered in it. In the trunk, they found bedding. It was a bedding set in a plastic bag. I'll show it to you on the screen. It's the kind of plastic container the bedding usually comes in. Inside was a comforter and a couple pillowcases. But right away, Tina noticed the pillowcases matched that melted fabric that was found on Celia's body. But of course, this all has to be confirmed. Here are the pillowcases. Now let me show you the portion of the burned fabric from the scene. Here's one picture and you can see, if you take a close look, it's got the same colors, red, dark blue, light blue, and white. Putting this together, investigators believe whoever left Celia's burning body on the side of the road had used her own vehicle to transport her there and then they moved it here. But who? Well, the first person investigators question are Celia's family members. And they let them know that she had a boyfriend who's 21 years old, his name was Mike Carter, and he needed to be looked into. So they call him into the station for an interview. Meanwhile, there are many other people being interviewed. There were friends of Celia's who were coming forward. They were shocked. Nobody thought this was really happening. But they came forward to talk about her personal life, what she did, who she hung out with on a regular basis, even neighbors from her apartment complex came forward. But let's hear from her boyfriend first. He had actually called in to the police station before they went to go locate him. Mike explained that the relationship was quite new or newish, a month or two at the most. And they asked him when the last time he saw her was. He explained that he went over to her apartment on the evening of Tuesday, December 28th and spent the night. The next day on Wednesday the 29th, which was the last time her parents reported seeing her, Mike says that Celia told him she was busy, she had to go run some errands, and she would come home later that night and they would meet back up. Remember, this was the night that Celia told her childhood friend, Indy, that she would go out for some drinks, and then she planned to go home 
but she never showed up at Indy's place. So whatever happened to her happened after she left her parents' house, and that was estimated to be around 6 p.m., but she was unaccounted for after that. Well, they pressed Mike about what he was doing that night, and he explained that he was waiting on Celia for hours, and by midnight, when he still didn't hear from her, he was starting to worry. So around 1 or 1.30, he begins trying to call her phone, but it just kept going to voicemail. So he kept calling. Around 1.45, which was about an hour before the 911 call came in from that mother and daughter that saw the fire on the side of the road, he calls again. Finally, someone picks up. He hears a, a woman's voice say, hello, who's this? He thinks it's Aaliyah, and he's like, it's Mike. But then he could tell it wasn't his girlfriend on the other line. So he's like, is Celia there? The woman responds by telling Mike that Celia's asleep. And he's thinking, um, okay. First off, who answers someone else's cell phone? And who's this woman? <laughs> he's like, can you wake her up? It's important. And then there was a pause as though the woman was going to tell Celia. And then she comes back and she's like, you know what? She's going to call you tomorrow. And he's like, okay then. And that was it. He told the investigators he doesn't know who this person was that answered his girlfriend's phone and that he doesn't know what happened to her. He had never heard from her since. Now phone records were being looked into and from what they could see from Mike's phone itself, he was telling the truth about calling Celia. They had him there for hours, extensively questioning him. Meanwhile, Celia's neighbors had been coming forward, like I said, and they said that they heard a lot of commotion in the form of arguing coming from Celia's apartment on more than one occasion, specifically a man yelling. And they had seen a man with Celia on a number of occasions, but they could not provide investigators with a name of this supposed boyfriend. But they seemed to have a rocky relationship with Celia. Well, Mike insisted, that's not him. That's not, they're not describing their relationship because he's only been with her for a couple months. And he's adamant about that. He said they had just been talking before that. And he hadn't even been at her place that much. So investigators asked Mike if he has any idea what ex or the name of an ex that Celia may have been heard arguing with in the past. And Mike says he doesn't really know. The only thing he knows from seeing text messages on Celia's phone are initials AD. He doesn't know if this guy was the one that she's been fighting with. He doesn't know all that business. But he knows that she's still kept in touch with a guy she dated named AD. Well, we know that Celia dated Tony, full name Antonio Drayton, initials AD, and that they had broken up in the summer, but that they had still remained friends. So he's definitely the next person on the detective's radar. Anyone involved in Celia's life are part of this current investigation. Investigators mentioned the name Antonio Drayton to Celia's family, and of course, they never approved of him in the first place, so they do not have positive things to say. However, Celia was very private about her relationship. One time, her arm was in a sling. And when she asked her about it, she said she dislocated while she was doing cheerleading, but Sean wasn't buying it. She had been very close to her sister their entire life, and she knew how athletic she was. She was quick on her feet, according to Sean. And even if she were to lose her balance or fall, Sean said she would still know how to break her fall. This did not seem likely. She thought there was much more to the story and the reason she started connecting this was actually because of other injuries. The next one was when Sean saw injuries on her like bruises or other injuries that she would inquire about and Celia would tell her things like, oh, I, I fell down the stairs, but that didn't make sense. Now, of course, this is coming after Sean knows that her sister is dead and there wasn't any proof, so to speak, that this was true, but of course it interests investigators. Sean said that she had tried to get information out of her sister, but the most likely, Celia was too embarrassed to talk about it and she just wouldn't open up. And again, before they even have a chance to go looking for this AD, Antonio Drayton, a young man walks up to investigators. They're at Celia's apartment and guess how he introduced himself? He also says that he's Celia's boyfriend, as in current, present tense, not ex, but boyfriend. And he tells them he's devastated. He tells them he found out what happened to Celia a few days ago. But initially, he called police on January 1st after he came out of his apartment to find red paint had been splattered all over his front door. That same day, he was notified about the body being found on the side of the road and that later it was identified as Celia. He assumed, just because of everything that had gone on in the relationship, that her parents were responsible for throwing that paint on his front door. But it turns out, just for the record, her parents didn't even know at that point 
So this definitely was not them. He says he's there to provide any information he can, just like everyone else has, and that he's devastated about hearing about her death. He volunteers to come down to the police station and give them any and all information they want about Celia. So now it's Antonio's turn to face the pressure. The detectives want him to begin with how he met Celia. I have a portion of this interview. I will play it, but I will also tell you what he said in case the audio is terrible, because I have a new mic. So my audio keeps getting better, which means that these recordings sound even worse. Detective Duffenmeyer was conducting this interview with Antonio, who said that he and Celia met around two years ago out at the club. They had a connection right away. They messaged back and forth on MySpace. She started the conversation. And then they ended up into a passionate physical relationship. Then to clarify, the detectives asked him if he and Celia were exclusive, like committed, that she was the only girl he was with, and vice versa. And his answer was interesting. Oh, no, 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 man. That's, I was seeing other women, that sort of thing. But she took it as I was her boyfriend. She didn't know none of this at first. He was like, you mean like just one or more than one woman? The detective was like, she dated you and you dated her? I mean, it was confusing because he had told them he was her boyfriend. But now he says, oh, no, 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 no. I was seeing other women, that sort of thing. But he admits that Celia took their interaction as being boyfriend and girlfriend, and that she didn't know about him seeing other people at first. In the beginning, she was under the impression that it was just him and her together. Well, now the investigators know there could be reasons that they would argue, considering at some point they assume Celia caught wind of Antonio being unfaithful. So they ask him, have you ever hit her? Antonio told them no. He didn't, but he admits that they definitely got into arguments and he had, in his words, slammed her. He slammed her and may have pushed her, but he said, I won't punch. He went on to say, I wish she was around, sort of like, I wish she was here to tell you herself. And I'm sure they wish that too. But he went on to explain that he never punched her. In his words, he said, quote, I would not punch that girl. I would not. I would not. No, I would not. No. No, well, I didn't, we didn't got in some fights. I slammed her. I slammed her and made pushed her. I have, but I, I won't. I won't punch her. I wish she was around. I never punched her. I would not punch that girl. I would not, and I would not. No, no, I would not. No. Now they want to know what Antonio was doing during the time frame that they believe that Celia had been killed, and he gets a little frustrated, and expressed that because he's like, "You guys are going by time frames," and I know that's hard on people. Like if you ask me what time I did something last week. I'm not going to be able to tell you. And that can make someone feel very uncomfortable when they're being questioned about someone being killed. It would definitely frustrate a person. And Antonio made that clear. Him having to sit there and confirm exact times was not easy for him. But he said, I can tell you this. When he was not hanging out with Celia, which he also made it clear he still did, by the way, he was with other girls. So if he wasn't with her, he was with someone else. And there wasn't just one. He admitted he was a sneaky person who was always covering up his cheating and juggling a number of women. It's just who he was. But what that meant to him was that he was with someone other than her since he wasn't with Celia that night, and he knows that. He was with one of his many other women that he hooks up with, and he would have to check and get back to them. He'd have to, like, kind of go through his phone and figure it out. My thing is, all this is, like, frustrating. It's all frustrating to me, and it's, like, discombobulated because I have to sit down and you're going by time frames. You're going by time frames, and I'm, I'm thinking too fast and doing too much. At the same time, I'm telling you, when I'm not with her, I'm, with, I'm, 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 I'm being sneaky or doing something else. He knows that the last time he saw Celia in person was December 26th. According to him, they were still seeing each other here and there, but he was keeping it a secret from his girlfriend, or trying, his girlfriend, Angela Owens. We'll get to her in just a moment. He was specifically asked if he killed Celia, and he immediately says, no, I did not kill Celia. And he repeated, I did not kill Celia Huda. Then repeating it a third time, saying, I did not kill this woman. Then they ask him, do you know who killed this woman? And he quickly and adamantly said, no, I do not know who killed this woman. I did not kill this woman, and I do not know who killed this woman. And that he knows he's lied, he's done things wrong to her, even when she was good to him, 
and even when she was there for him. Did you kill Salim? No, I did not kill no Salim. I did not kill Salim. No, I did not kill Salim. I did not kill this woman. Do you know who killed this girl? No, I do not know who killed this woman. I did not kill this woman. I do not know who killed this woman. I lied. I lied. I done wrong, but she was good to me. And even when I, even when I was, she was there for me. So after checking his phone and everything, he was able to tell the investigators that he was with someone else on Wednesday night, the night that they told him that Celia had gone missing. He admits he was with his friend, Cassandra Kembro. She's actually one of his coworkers. They work together at a factory that he's employed at. She's much older than him, 42 years old, he's 24. And she kind of took him under her wing, so to speak. She's a single mom. They got to know each other from work. And that night, she was at his place. She dropped in from time to time, bringing him food, kind of acting like a mother figure to him. Helped him out when he needed anything. And she was there that night. Well, just like when they asked him about how he met Celia and what the status of their relationship was, they pressed him about Cassandra, who he referred to as Cass. The investigator was like, okay, so y'all are just friends or what? Of course not. He admits, well, yeah, we're really good friends, but he's not gonna lie. She's sort of a friend with benefits, but she's not one of his girlfriends, nothing like that. He, he admits that they sleep together, but like on the down low, like his homies don't even know about it. It's not something known to anyone close to him. To them, she's just the coworker, the mother figure. She comes over when his friends are there. Even when Celia used to come over, Cass would be there with his friends, with everyone, even his main girlfriend, Angela Owens. So now we have yet a third woman that Antonio is naming that he's involved with. I'm sure investigators' heads were just spinning. I know mine was. And they're trying to make sense and clarify everything. It's important. We have to know all the players, right? So Cass, she's older. She's mature. She knows about the other women in his life, and she doesn't care. It's purely a sex thing between the two of them. Here's his description of Cass. Cass knows everything that goes on, and she plays like the friendly part. Or whatever, I do my thing, she don't say nothing. It's like Cass can come to the house and, and nobody she's knows. She, she's just a friend of me, and that's all they see. Friends with benefits? Yeah, she, uh, she won't say nothing to none of them. I get it. And there are many women that are okay with that. But that wasn't how Celia operated, and it wasn't how his current girlfriend Angela did either. They were younger, and they didn't they didn't go for that. Angela didn't like the fact that Celia was still in Antonio's life, and Celia didn't like the fact that Angela was now in his life. But Antonio admits that Angela was his new girlfriend, and he had since admitted everything to her. He wanted to come clean. He talked about still seeing Celia, that he had been sexual with Cass as well. And he said, he, like, he didn't really want to, but he said he ended up having to come clean recently when Angela was calling him out on his BS, telling him that she didn't trust him, especially about whether he was still seeing Celia. She straight up asked him if they were still hanging out or talking, and Antonio told her no, they were not. But she wanted him to prove it. So in order to, I guess, gain that trust back, he admitted everything that he had done before because she was the girl he really wanted to be with the one that he called his girlfriend, and he wanted to make sure she didn't leave him. This is a lot of information, much of which doesn't really help investigators, but they do confirm his alibi, and it checks out. He also volunteers to give them a DNA sample, and at this point, they have nothing to hold him on, so Antonio is free to leave. And of course, now, the real investigation into what he told them begins. They have three names. They need to run background checks on his, Cassandra Kimbrough, and Angela Owens. And they want to find out everything they can about them. And if they have any connection to Celia, remember a woman answered her phone the night she went missing, right before that 911 call came in. First, they look up Antonio Drayton. He was born in 1986, and unfortunately, his childhood was less than idyllic. He was passed back and forth to different foster homes and orphanages after being given up after birth. He didn't have a mother figure or a father figure for many years, but finally, as a teenager, he found a loving home where his foster parents gave him love, affection, and instilled morals in him by making church a central part of their lives. Antonio's records indicate that he did well in school. He had been employed for many years at his current job, and he grew up with other siblings in his home, including his brothers Charles and Pedro Jonas. They were very close, and they still hung out a lot, even after they had grown up into adults with lives of their own. When they did ask Pedro about his brother and what he was like as a person, he said that he was always loving, he was a caring brother to him, that they spent a lot of time growing up going to church, he was loyal, and anytime anyone in the family needed anything, they could count on Antonio. 
He only had one downfall, and that was women. Pedro admitted that as soon as puberty hit, Antonio just couldn't focus on anything else. It was all about chasing women. And that was his only real vice. He would always be getting in trouble with his foster parents because he was out with some girl and no longer interested in school, for example. Pedro said Antonio couldn't wait to be on his own so he could be with whoever he wanted, and that kind of sounds a lot like Celia once felt. Pedro explains that Antonio's smart, he's charismatic, and that attracted a lot of women. He was pretty much known as a player. He went out a lot, he liked to party. He kind of liked living that playboy lifestyle, and to fund it, Pedro said he worked really hard. Long days, late nights, and that was another thing that ladies really liked about him. He was a hard worker, he had really good work ethic. And speaking of work, once they get in contact with Cassandra Kimbrough, she explains. She's 42 years old, she was raised by a hardworking single mom, and by the time she was 20, she also became a single mom herself. She had been in serious relationships here and there in her past, but by the time she was working at the warehouse and she met Antonio, her children were at the top of her mind all the time. She was working two part-time jobs, trying to provide for them. She was at the point where she was just trying to have fun. And she met Antonio, who was young and outgoing and attractive, and they would flirt with one another at work. But finally, it was Cassandra that pursued more than a friendship with Antonio. And of course, he obliged. He didn't resist her sexual advances, and they were not in a committed relationship. Cassandra explained they had sex like any time they were lonely, and Cassandra didn't mind that he saw other women. She knew about them. And Antonio would confide in her, being that she was older and more mature. She would offer advice, help him with certain things around his house. And she was there the night of Wednesday, December 29th, into the 30th. She actually spent the night that night. She signed a sworn statement stating that she was with Antonio at the time of Celia's death. She also said she had no involvement or knowledge of Celia's death, and she submitted for a DNA test. Now, they had pretty much a clear picture of who Cassandra was, especially in relation to the case, but who was Angela Owens? You know the drill. They begin asking around, starting with asking Cassandra, and it's known that Angela is Antonio's new main girlfriend. They also ask Celia's friends, and Kaya says that she's actually really close friends with Angela in addition to being really close to Celia, and that made things really hard on her being in the middle. She found out that Angela was dating her friend's boyfriend and that they had been seeing each other before Celia and Antonio had ended anything. So that was a turning point. That was actually a breaking point, according to Kaya. Celia knew that Antonio was cheating. And she had found things before, but now with Angela, it was more serious. Celia had stayed around previously because back then, she knew there were other girls, but it was maybe only a sex thing. And maybe he would convince her that they didn't mean anything to her, but Angela came into the picture and she became number one and Celia was pushed to the side and this wasn't okay with Celia. Instead of breaking it off right away though, her friend said she was a little bit obsessive about trying to find out who Antonio was with, kind of tracking down these girls and asserting some kind of dominance because Antonio was still okay seeing Celia, even though he would act like Angela was his one and only. Behind Angela's back, he was still texting and meeting up with Celia, probably with other girls as well. And it kind of became Celia's goal to make that fact known to Angela, hoping that it would result in her leaving him so she could swoop back in and be first in Antonio's life. But Angela wasn't gonna leave that easily, especially because you heard what Antonio said. He told investigators he would reassure her he was not seeing Celia. But as his brother Pedro explained, women were his weakness. He couldn't say no. If it were up to him, he would have kept them all. Angela and Celia were at odds with one another, and that's actually how Celia ended up in jail and her fingerprints were taken, which later connected her with the body. Kaya told investigators that about two months earlier in October, both Angela and Celia showed up at the same club where I guess Antonio would hang out often with them, and that's how Angela actually met him, out at a club. Sound familiar? But this particular night, Celia saw her and she lost it. She was at her breaking point. They bumped into each other and seeing Antonio's other woman in person, it set her off. They started to go back and forth and it turned into a physical altercation. And Kaya explained that even though Angela was much 
taller than Celia, that didn't matter because Celia was small, but she was feisty and athletic. And she had put up with a lot over those last two years and it all came out. So Angela backed down and became afraid of Celia. She goes on after this and got a restraining order against her. Angela told police she was getting threatening text messages from Celia and that she had just been attacked at the club. So this protective order is issued against Celia so she could no longer be allowed in the vicinity of Angela Owens and can't reach out to her or she will be arrested. Well, we know she was arrested. So Kaya explained that about a month after that, in November, Antonio and her were still not hanging out because Angela was in the picture. But at some point, they started texting again, mostly because Celia wanted to apologize for her actions. She wanted to smooth things over with Antonio. She had cooled down from what had happened and she was seeing things more clearly. So they connected again. And Celia decided to go over his apartment unannounced, don't ask me why. She dropped in. Maybe she thought they could work things out. Well, when she gets there, he and Angela are having a little date night. They're eating dinner together. Celia was not expecting that. Who knows when Antonio had been saying to her, probably feeding her lines about how he's not seeing Angela anymore, blah, blah, blah. Celia lost it again. Apparently, she went over to Angela and smacked a piece of pizza out of her hand. So Angela called the cops. And they came, and they arrested Celia for violating the restraining order. That is how she got the mugshot. That is how her fingerprints were taken and put in the database. Now, Kaya mentioned that even though it looks like Celia is the bad actor here, you have to look at everything and put it in context. You have to look at the way that Antonio had been treating Celia. He too had been arrested on account of becoming physical with Celia. Because Kaya was friends with both Angela and Celia, she had a lot of information about the entire situation. So she wanted to make a point to say that after the arrest, it hit Celia that this isn't the person she wanted to be. It had gone to a point where she was embarrassed. She was asking herself, what are you doing? So Kaya said she wanted to leave Antonio for a while, but it was at that point where it just made sense to Celia that enough was enough. He was really bringing her down to a new low, and this wasn't who she was. That's when she decided to officially end it with Antonio and focus on her goals, get back to what was really important, school and her other activities. But even before that, Kaya said, back in June, before all this happened, Antonio attacks Leah in her apartment and she called the police in the middle of this altercation. This confirmed to investigators that it was Antonio who the neighbors heard arguing with Celia. They made a point to do more digging, especially into his criminal record. But first, they've got Angela in the station for questioning. I know this is a lot. When you have all these people to look into and keep track of, imagine how hard it is for investigators but they have to keep going. And I'm trying to keep things together for you so that we can stay on track. So Angela Owens, she's a person of interest. It's January 5th. She sits down with investigators. She explained most of what we already know about how she met Antonio. And now they wanna know where she was on Wednesday. So then the next day week is Wednesday. Wednesday, I went to work. She said she went to work and was not involved in anything related to Celia. And as a matter of fact, she said that just four days before, she spoke to Celia. At this point, Celia had a new man in her life, Mike Carter. She was focusing on the right things for the last couple months. So she apologized to Angela. After the apology, the two of them talked about things and Angela said to her, if we had just talked, communicated from the beginning, she would have never put a restraining order on Celia. So she apologized about that. And um, I just, I basically was just like, if if me and her could have talked from the beginning, then there would have, I would have never put a restraining order. She was just like, I just want to get this injunction dropped so that I can graduate and move on with my life. And the reason that Celia had reached out and wanted to make amends was because she wanted the injunction dropped so she could get past it and move on. She just wanted to graduate and get on with her life. So that's all the information Angela provides. She also gives a swab of her DNA and she gives them permission to carry out a search of her vehicle. They did corroborate that she was at work at the time they think Celia had gone missing and been killed. They found Angela to be very cooperative. She provided them with very good information and seemed to be very forthcoming. It didn't seem like she had any hard feelings against Celia. She leaves and they wait for results from the DNA collected from Antonio, Cassandra, and now Angela. The investigators had been going around to gas stations that were close to where Celia's body was found, 
and pulling up security footage. They wanted to see if they could spot anyone buying gasoline, putting into a gas can, or anything suspicious, and they don't get any leads. By Saturday, January 8th, more than 200 of Celia's family members and her friends gathered for a candlelight vigil. It was held in her honor at the Rights Union Amphitheater, where Celia used to go to practice dancing with the African Student Union. Speaking on behalf of the Huda family was James Asegbi, a UF assistant professor in languages. He said, quote, the family's grateful for the support it has gotten from the community. In Ghana at these times, it's the community that sustains us. This really shows that the same community is here, end quote. He went on to say that it's a custom in Ghana to have a public ceremony that everyone was invited to. And this celebration was beautiful. It included videos of Celia doing cheerleading and dancing, along with her friends speaking and her cousins speaking. Dance team members performed dances. People who knew her and loved her talked about how much they were going to miss her. The vigil was put together by the University of Florida Center for Student Activities and the UF Competitive Cheerleading Squad, in addition to the African Student Union. Many of her friends spoke. One of them was Simona Days. They had known each other for 11 years. And she said the fact that so many people showed up just goes to show you what an amazing person Celia was, what a good friend she was, and how many lives she touched. The choreographer that I talked about earlier, he talked about how energetic Celia was, how big her heart was, that she made them realize that no matter what is going on in life, you can always be a kid again. He also pointed out that sometimes they would practice at the same spot late at night, and it brought back so many memories. Cadelia Hall was a friend who met Celia when they were working closely at Fort Clark Middle School, where Celia used to volunteer with an after-school program. Back in 2008, Catilia met her. She remembered that Celia used to call her mama. It was because she found out that Catilia didn't have any daughters of her own. So she offered her on that day, from that day forward, to be her daughter. That's just who Celia was. She wanted everyone to feel loved and accepted. She said of Celia, quote, I thought of her as my beautiful butterfly, and now she's flying away beautifully, end quote. Celia's friend Amanda Roguette of the cheerleading squad said that, quote, I was fortunate to have cheered with Celia the last year, and she was one of the girls who contributed the most to our team. She was not only amazing at cheerleading, she was the heart and soul of our team. She told Celia, may you fly forever. You're certainly in a better place. Rest in peace. Her cousin Ellen, through tears, explained that she didn't have anyone to talk about nursing to anymore now that Celia's gone. They used to spend hours discussing their future plans, and now that's all over. Celia's parents had just fallen apart. They refused to speak to reporters. Her death was actually the second high-profile tragedy in the year that her family and her cousin Danielle had to go through. Her uncle, a UF doctoral student, Kofi Adu Brempong, was shot in March in his campus apartment by a university police officer. Luckily, he survived the ordeal, but that case was followed by a ton of protests, and as a result, things were changed at the university. So this was a lot for the family to take in. Now they had lost someone, also a UF student. It was very heartbreaking, but they also wanted this to be a celebration of life. An African drum circle was formed and everyone was asked to do what Celia loved most, to dance in her honor. It was a sad moment, but they knew that Celia would want them to be happy and she was there in spirit. She would want them to celebrate her life and not be in mourning, so that's what they did. At this point, the authorities had still not ruled her death a homicide. They were waiting to hear from the medical examiner. Investigators look deeper into Antonio Drayton's criminal record, and they pull up that police report back on June 16th, when he was arrested on domestic battery accusations by Celia. She alleged that Antonio came to her apartment uninvited. When she wouldn't let him inside, he pushed his way through her door, and she accused him of kicking through a locked bathroom door that she was hiding in. Then he pushed her down and he started to choke her. After that, Celia said that he took over $1,000 in items from her apartment. Antonio was charged with battery, burglary, and larceny. However, once Celia cooled down, she had second thoughts. She didn't want to go through with the charges because she didn't want to testify against him. So she dropped all the charges. She wrote a letter to the prosecutors. She explained that the items he took were actually things he owned and he had come over to claim them. There was also someone with him at the time that this incident occurred. It was another woman, 
There were no more details provided on her identity, but she also wrote a letter to the prosecutors disputing the allegations against Antonio. She mirrored what Celia had stated, that the items belonged to him. When Antonio was confronted about the situation, he said he was drunk. He pushed her, but he never choked her. And the things he took were actually things he had purchased for her himself. And that was during their breakup, but they remained friends afterwards. It's clear that the two of them had a very toxic relationship, yet both of them still kept coming back. Even after Celia had moved on with Mike Carter, it seems as though she was still keeping in contact with Antonio. Mike even saw a text between them. That's how he knew the initials A.D. And Antonio admits to seeing Celia in person just a few days before she was found dead. It's starting to look like one of the women that Antonio's involved with may have had a reason to harm Celia, and there's about to be an even bigger reason for this. Remember how I told you that the investigators were going to all these different gas stations close to where Celia was found on the side of the road? Here's a location on the map. Look at where these gas stations are. They're not very close by to where the road was. It's such a desolate area. However, they do begin going to them, obtaining the security footage, and it is tedious going through hours and hours to see if anything comes up. They didn't find anything. However, once they started looking at phone records after the interview with Mike, they wanted to see where Celia's phone pinged when the strange woman answered her phone when Mike called. It turned out her cell phone pinged in a town called Stark. It's about 25 minutes away from where Celia was found. They wouldn't have thought to look over there for gas stations, but once they got this new information, they began going station to station and grabbing footage from around the time frame of 1 to 2.30 in the morning, from the time the calls were coming in to the time they ended up finding her on the desolate road. And remember a witness said they saw a silver Nissan around 2.15 in the morning. Well, finally, after combing through hours of footage, they see something at approximately 1 o'clock in the morning. See that? It's a silver car pulling up to one of the pumps. When they blew this up and they zoomed in, they were able to confirm that this was Celia's car. Then a few seconds later, after it parks, someone gets out and walks inside the gas station. I'm going to pause it here. I'm going to show you what this person looks like. The investigators can tell the person's taller than Celia. It's a taller, lankier body frame. The person's wearing a blue camouflage jacket with their hood up and blue jeans or pants. As they come through the doors, you get a closer view. They also noticed that the person had what looked like a darker complexion and looked to have had longer hair. The transaction itself was pulled up at the gas station and the rep told them that the person purchased just over $2 in gasoline. And that's significant. I mean, of course, yes, they could have been short on cash, trying to get home, but they're basically driving Celia's car. And if you were going to fill up, let's say a receptacle, it stands to reason if gas was about, I don't know, $2 a gallon and you had a gallon gas can, kind of makes sense. Now, I personally don't have the footage of them filling up the container, but investigators said that's exactly what was caught on video. Then they put it into the car and they drove off. After seeing this footage, the theory is that whoever this person is, most likely they left this location and went straight to the roadside with Celia's body already in that car, took her out, placed her on the side of the road, doused her in gasoline, and lit her on fire. Or they left this location to retrieve her body from wherever it was, and then they went to the roadside. Either way, they believe this person is directly connected. So the most important task is to find out who this person is. They zoom in again, and it's very hard for us to see this because we don't have forensic video tools, but they determined that this was a woman and that the person's hair kind of looked long and some of it was hanging outside of the hood. In some of these clips, I can kind of see it if I zoom in. Investigators matched this hairstyle to Angela's. It's just the volume, the length, so they quickly pull up Angela's phone records to match them to Celia's. If they can put those two phones together on the same route, that's enough for arrest. But instead of matching with Celia's, they match with her alibi. She was at work and then she went home. So combing through the evidence and the information that they have, they realize that Antonio's foster family lives in Stark, which was close to this gas station. So they reach out to his friends and family. They're asking him, did you see Antonio that night? And finally, they get a new lead that will help them not only identify this person at the gas station, 
but also how everything connects. On January 12th, a friend calls in. He's a friend of Antonio's brother. He's calling in to respond to the investigator's inquiry about whether anyone had seen Antonio that night. He said he was told by someone close to Antonio that he came to his foster family's house in Stark unannounced around 11 p.m. asking for a gas can and a shovel. They get in contact with Pedro. He confirms it's true. He also tells them about a phone call with Antonio on New Year's Day that he thought was important. Pedro, why'd you wait? But finally, he said, you know, when I heard about what happened to Celia, he asked his brother what was up with that. His response was, ask Cass, as in, ask Cassandra. Antonio said, quote, if I go down, I ain't going down by myself, you know? End quote. Well, now, they have Cassandra's name coming up again. And they show Pedro and Antonio's family the gas station video, and immediately, they say they recognize the person in the footage as Cassandra Kimbrough. And they know all about her. They're very familiar with who she is and her intentions with Antonio. It doesn't seem like they're big fans of Cassandra, but investigators wonder if she would be jealous enough or angry enough at Celia, at this other woman in Antonio's life, to go so far as to kill her. It's taken less, so yes, they know it's possible. Since the family knows so much about the relationship, the investigators want to find out who Cassandra is and what her relationship really was with Antonio. Because the way Antonio described it, Cass was just one of his friends. She knew about the other women. She kept it a secret, and that was okay. But had she had enough? Did she want to be his main girl? Well, here's what they uncover about single mom Cassandra Kimbrough. She was a seemingly hardworking, quiet woman who wasn't necessarily looking for a relationship, but Antonio caught her eye at work. And just like he did with many other women, he captivated her and she couldn't help but flirt with him, even though he was only 22 and she was 40 at the time. Despite this almost 20-year age difference, there was something about Antonio that she couldn't resist. It's like she broke all of her own rules when it came to him. As she began flirting with Antonio, he liked the attention, especially because he was used to the girls at the club, the girls that he would meet. They were different than Cassandra. She was well-dressed, mature, she carried herself well. She had stability in her life. She was hardworking. And that interested him. Well, once Cassandra started getting this attention from a much younger guy that she was very physically attracted to, it made her feel like she hadn't felt in so many years. There was excitement. There was fantasy. It's like it made her feel young again. And I just want to stop and say that when I was researching all this and I kept hearing them make Cassandra out to be some haggard old woman, I kind of wanted to cringe. I'm 41. There's nothing old about me. Cassandra was a very attractive woman who was older than Antonio. But 40 years old is not an age to view someone as like decrepit or a fossil or something. But I digress. It just, it triggered me. Yes, she felt passion in her again. It was reunited. It was fun. It was new. And this is common at any age when you're having this new fling. Finally, the two of them got together and they started a sexual relationship. And that's when things went to a whole other level for Cassandra. Age did matter here because the men her age weren't doing the things that Antonio was. They both brought newness to each other in different ways. And eventually, both of them kept coming back for more. But the difference between Antonio and Cassandra was that he wanted more than just Cassandra. And she was a mature woman who had more experience with younger men in her past. And she knew that either she had to be okay with it and continue receiving the benefits she was receiving, or he would get sick of any jealousy or drama. Cassandra decided that the benefits were worth her being the cool, older cougar and letting him have his freedom. And on the other hand, Antonio was getting his needs met in many ways. Once he knew that Cassandra would always be around if one of his other girls wasn't available, he could have sex anytime he wanted. It was just a phone call or a text away. But he also grew up without a mother. There was something about Cassandra being older that drew him in. She took care of him. She would give him advice. She was his confidant. And she was also funding his lifestyle. It's true. Antonio was able to charm Cassandra enough that she began buying him things. From jewelry to paying his bills. Anything. So that she could remain an asset in his revolving door of women. This arrangement worked well for both of them especially for Cassandra. 
She could be around him all the time without women in his life thinking anything of it. She would pass herself off as the mama of the house, a dear friend, a co-worker that adored Antonio like a son. Even Antonio's friends had no idea that he was sleeping with her. This meant that she could also be a fly on the wall and know everything that was happening in Antonio's other relationships. She seemed to be the helpful older woman who cared about Antonio and his girlfriends, hanging out with them, being there to support them. But as soon as Celia or Angela or any of Antonio's other girls left, Cassandra was the one jumping in bed with him. With information comes control, and Cassandra was armed with all the inside information on everyone in Antonio's life, and she would keep him involved with her by making sure to give him anything he asked for. We know a woman was with him when the altercation happened at Celia's, which caused him to be arrested because a woman wrote to the prosecutor supporting Antonio's narrative. Could it have been Cassandra? I don't know. But it was also a woman who picked up the phone when Celia's current boyfriend called her the night of her murder. Could this have been Cassandra? Well, it's clear Antonio's family firmly believes it was her buying gas, filling up that gas can the night Celia's body was set on fire. The question remains, who killed Celia? When Angela had been questioned about Cassandra during her initial interview, she said neither her nor any of Antonio's other girls ever saw Cassandra as competition. She said that Tony had pretty much convinced all of them that this was just a lady who was looking after him. She was just always there to help, so never once did anyone think there was any kind of relationship going on past that. However, when they asked Angela if anything stood out to her in the time leading up to Celia's murder, she makes an interesting observation. She said she was over Antonio's on the evening of December 31st, and now it even made more sense as to why Antonio was asking her what he did. He asked Cassandra for bleach, rags, and gloves. So now investigators go back to the phone records and they look at the ones between Antonio and Celia and it is clear that in a month or so prior to her death, Antonio was the one reaching out. Celia was not returning his calls or his text messages, but by winter break, Antonio had finally convinced Celia to speak to him again and to see him. Text records show that on Wednesday night, Antonio was planning to meet up with Celia for a hookup after Angela left for work. Around the time Angela was leaving, he got a text from Celia that said, where are you? He responded with, I'm home. She asked how long he was going to be there and he let her know that he was free, as in, I'm alone, you can come by. After that, Antonio kept texting. He was saying things like, where are you? And he even called her around 3 a.m. When questioned about this, he tells investigators that that's why he spent the night with Cassandra after all, because Celia never showed up. So he figured, okay, well, I guess she made other plans. He said that he did try calling her around 3 a.m., but he went to voicemail. And that's when he actually got worried. He said the only time that Celia doesn't answer her phone is when she's with her parents or she's mad at him, but she never turned her phone off. Now they wonder if Celia had gone over there all along and something went wrong. Antonio and Cassandra were each other's alibis, which is very convenient. Now, all of this is circumstantial at this point. It's not enough for an arrest. They do, however, go back over everything. And using the information from family, friends, and medical records, investigators are able to tie several of Celia's injuries in the past to fights that she had with Antonio. So there was a history of violence between them. And it's known to escalate in cases like this. Now they start looking at Antonio and Cassandra's phone pings on the night of the murder. And sure enough, they are not at his home where they said they were. Instead, guess where their phones were pinging? I know you already guessed. It was off on that remote area on the side of the road where the fire was set. <laughs> yep. 10 minutes before the 911 call came in. But you know that's still not enough. Cell phone pings aren't always exact. And just because someone was near the scene doesn't prove they committed a crime. So they keep searching. They look at where Celia's car was found and realize it's only a three minute drive, a 10 minute or so walk from Antonio's place at Pine Rush Apartments right here on the map. The car could have easily been dropped there and they could have made it back to Antonio's on foot. Not only that, a woman comes forward. Quintisha Aldridge, she's 24, she lives out in Stark. She tells them, 
On December 31st, which would be the day after the night of the fire, she drove Antonio out to a dumpster at the Turtle Oaks apartment complex around 2.30 p.m. so he could pick up a key. A key. That's interesting. That's where Celia's car was found. So was this her key or was it a key that someone left for him? Maybe Cassandra dropped Antonio back off in Stark to stay with this other woman or his family. And then this other woman drove him back to his place, which was only three minutes away from where her car was found. What do you think this key was for? Investigators feel like they're getting closer. So they go back to the evidence that was collected at the crime scene. Antonio's friends and family do not recognize the melted phone case. So now they're relying on DNA evidence, any that could have made it through this fire and been on these items. But these tests take time, so they have no choice but to wait. During this time frame, some very unusual things start to happen. On January 24th, court records reveal that Cassandra Kimbrough changed her legal name to Sandra. She got a new driver's license with a different date of birth, a different address, and a six-inch height difference. Wow. I wonder what she was trying to cover up. However, this still does not prove anything until February 2nd when the DNA results come back in. Remember that paper napkin that was in perfect condition on the side of the road? Well, guess what? It had Antonio Drayton's DNA on it, and that was enough to arrest both him and the woman who was formerly known as Cassandra Kimbrough. That same day, the medical examiner, William Hamilton, released the report with Celia's official cause of death. It was determined that she was killed before that fire was started, and the cause of her death was ruled as homicidal violence of an undetermined type. We will get into that. On February 2nd, 2011, 35 days after Celia's body was found, police arrested both Antonio Drayton and Cassandra Kimbrough for first-degree murder. They were both brought into the station. They were put in two separate interrogation rooms. And investigators are hoping that with all the evidence that they have against them, they will get a quick confession. First, they press Antonio. They confront him with all the evidence. The most damning, the paper napkin. The detective said, we know you were there. That's when they show him the napkin. They're like, you see that? He's like, what? See what? The detectives are like, you see that little white thing? Showing him this photo right here. So Antonio leans in as the detective explains, that's a napkin. They ask him, guess whose DNA is all over it? Yours. Something that I want to say before I tell you his reaction, and don't come for me, I'm just making an observation. He's someone close to Celia. He'd been in her car before, I assume. He could have left that napkin months ago. DNA stays on items. And to me, if it was her car that was there at the scene and it fell out, that isn't hard evidence that he killed her. That's just a side note. What's important is that it did elicit a response from Antonio, and that's what they wanted. More than anything else, they're using this evidence to put pressure on their suspects and hope they will crack. It's up to a court and a jury to convict someone. They're innocent until proven guilty. When Antonio is confronted with all of this, he finally breaks down. He says that Cass and Leah, as he called them, Cassandra and Celia, got in a fight. According to him, Cassandra went over to Celia's apartment to collect on some money that Celia had owed him. This sounds a lot like the time that he went over there to steal back things that he purchased before. Maybe this was a regular occurrence. Maybe anytime he was low on cash, this is what he did. But he goes on to say, Cassandra came back and she told him that she got into a fight with Celia and killed her. He said, and these are, these are quoted phrases from him. He said, Cass told me what she did when she came to my house. We didn't get into details about it because I was spooked. I told her, don't talk about it. Don't say anything. He also told her that he didn't know what to do. So that's the end of his quoted phrases of what he said. And it sounds plausible for sure. We know Cassandra does a lot of things for Antonio. She makes sure he has cash. She knows his issues with other women in his life. And I can imagine him telling her to go over there, this older woman, and get his money. And I can see both Celia and Cassandra getting feisty and this happening. But there's a problem with this version of the story. The investigators had already looked into anyone that could have gone into Celia's apartment complex during the time frame in question because they had a security gate there. 
Everyone who entered that gate had to either open it with a key card, which was registered to a particular tenant, or someone had to call them in, or they had to give a security guard their information, and he would call. No one entered that wasn't accounted for. So they tell that to Antonio. Nice try. We know that's not what happened, so he backpedals. He said, okay, when I said she never came over that night, I lied. After Andrea left, he said Celia did come over, and so did Cassandra, and that is when the fight happened between these two women. Now, this seems plausible too, because we know the same scenario played out just a couple months ago. Celia confronted Angela at Antonio's apartment. So this could have happened again between Celia and Cassandra. Antonio explains they just all got caught up in it. He tells investigators that Cassandra took a fire extinguisher and hit Celia over the head with it. She fell to the floor and got knocked out. And at that point, Antonio thought she was dead. And that to test this, Cassandra actually got on top of her and stood on her chest, but that he couldn't touch her. Wow. <sighs> with all of this information, the investigators go over to the room that Cassandra's in and they present her with everything that Antonio said happened. Cassandra's calm, she's cooperative, she sits down with detectives, and right away she said she has nothing to do with Celia's death and she can promise them that. But if she didn't do it, who did? She responded that she doesn't know. She said like she told them before, she went to Tony's and she just stayed the night. I don't know what else to say. I have nothing to do with her death. I promise you that. And who did? I don't know. I really don't know. All I did was, like I told you, I went to Tony's house and I just stayed there. Well, the woman detective pipes up. She's like, who are you trying to protect right now, Tony? Because he's not worth it. And thank you, ma'am. Thank you. He's not worth it. He never has been worth it. Cassandra was like, no. She's adamant that she doesn't know what happened. They were at this for hours. They wanted to get a confession. And finally, finally, one of the detectives is like, we need to set the record straight. The truth is the truth. Who are you trying to protect right now? Tony? Because no. he's not worth it. Set the record straight. The truth is the truth. Cassandra breaks down. She's almost in tears and she says, quote, but everyone's going to think I'm a horrible person. End quote. I'm a human. This is Kimber speaking. I'm a human. I felt for her in that moment because... I truly think this woman was under Antonio's spell. It doesn't excuse anything she says next, but I feel for her. Both detectives are like, listen, no. If you don't tell us what happened, then people are gonna think that you killed her because you're jealous of her. They can tell that she is about to crack. So they say, slow down. Let's go back to the beginning. That way, Cassandra can take a moment. She can tell them everything how she met Antonio, how the relationship progressed, and that's how we have a lot of what I told you, how we made her feel, how she was giving him money, and then finally they get up to the night that Celia went missing. Detectives ask her if she knew something happened before she went over to Antonio's, and she said no. She said that she came over like usual, and when she came in, he was just sitting there. That's when he told her he did something to Celia, and she's like, stop lying. And Tony explained, Celia and him got into a conversation and he told her the truth about everything, about Angela, about Cass, about all the other women. And Celia got upset. She threatened to call the police or do something to him and get him in trouble. And that's when everything happened. Cassandra never specifically said that Antonio killed Celia, but it was clear because he asked her to help him get rid of the body. What would you have done? If you were in the same situation, if your man or the man you're seeing just told you that this happened with his ex, tell me in the comments if you're brave enough to be honest, what were her options at this point? Cassandra said that she felt threatened and that she felt forced to help him. Do you think that's true? Or do you think that she was playing the mother figure and that she was helping him because that had been part of her job the last couple of years? doing anything that Antonio wanted. Ultimately, they wrapped Celia's body up and they put her in the trunk of her own car. Then they drove to Antonio's relative's house. Now I wanted to say, this was interesting because that bedding set, they put that, if it wasn't Celia's, they put that in the car to essentially get rid of it. So there was a lot of planning going on in these moments. They drove to Antonio's relative's house and Cassandra waited outside in the car. 
The detectives ask her if she saw him come back to the car carrying anything, and Cassandra said yes, a gas can and a shovel. Then they proceeded to go to that gas station where Cassandra tried to hide her identity with the hood and the jacket, and they bought the gas. And then they went to the side of that desolate road. Cassandra said that Antonio made her pour gasoline on top of Celia's lifeless body. She said she wanted to go home. She wanted to leave so bad, but that he kept holding things against her and threatening her until she finally did as he said. Then he lit Celia on fire and jumped back in the car and said, go. Cassandra said she was praying at this point, and she was praying for Celia too. This seems like the most likely scenario to detectives. 24-year-old Antonio Devon Drayton was arrested and charged with first-degree murder. 42-year-old Cassandra Kimbrough was charged with accessory to first-degree murder, and they were both charged with grand theft, abuse of a dead human body, tampering with physical evidence, and willful burning of lands. The prosecutors decided to offer Cassandra a plea deal because through everything they put together, they believed that Cassandra was telling the truth, that she was not at Antonio's until after Celia was already killed. So they wanted to give the appropriate charges for her cooperation in exchange for testifying against Antonio. Her deal was two years in prison with eight years of community supervision or probation. Well, when Antonio finds out that his devoted lover, Cassandra, is going to spill the details and testify against him, he also takes a plea deal. On May 24, 2012, he was sentenced to 45 years in prison. His current release date is September 8th, 2053. He never gave a reason why he killed Celia. He's the only person that knows what really happened that day. What do you think transpired and why? And was this justice? Nothing is going to bring Celia back. Her family is just sad that they couldn't do anything to help her before this happened. Her sister, Sean, said that she was in the process of trying to find a way to get through to her about all of this, about Antonio and the toxic relationship, but anytime she tried to bring it up, Celia would brush it off. It's really hard being on the outside when you can see all of the red flags and they're just sitting there waving, but no matter what we try to say to our loved ones who change their minds, as they say, all is fair in love and war. But love shouldn't be a war. Love should not hurt. That's enough of a sign that you deserve more. Celia deserved more. I think she was coming around. She was trying to move on with someone else, but Antonio still had her heart. And she was a loving person. She wanted to give him chance after chance, thinking that he would change but it was too late. I don't think Antonio ever wanted Celia to move on. I don't think he was okay that she was with Mike. I think that was a signal to him that maybe she was going to slip out of his fingertips, and that's why he kept pursuing her, even after she kept ignoring his calls. I think something of the holidays and being nostalgic, it brought her back in. Who knows what he said to get her back at his apartment? But I think this was a case of if he couldn't have her Nobody could. I'm so sorry to Celia. I'm so sorry to her family. I will also leave some resources below for help if you know someone that's in a domestic situation or if you are. Thank you so much for watching. I will see you in my next video. Bye.